scattering, but also about some uh, elastic scattering. But now uh, related to magnetism, uh, which actually I, I, I purposely avoided um, in, uh, in the earlier uh, discussion. So, uh, so actually, this is a, this is a very uh, important application for neutron scattering because, you know, as I mentioned before, this is the only way neutrons see the electrons. And as I was mentioning before, for the most part in solid state chemistry, physics, material science, uh, it's really electronic properties uh, that, that we're primarily interested in. And, um, uh, and, and this is really a killer application for neutron scattering. So, uh, so magnetic neutron scattering is sufficiently uh, powerful that it's often the case that for a particular problem in magnetic materials, if a neutron scattering experiment uh, can be done, uh, it's, it's usually, it's often definitive. It often kind of sets the tone for the whole field actually. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an important application. Actually, this is also the area that I, that, uh, I happen to work in. Uh, so I might be somewhat biased in my uh, outlook. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, so, so I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about that. Uh, and then I'll talk uh, generally about magnetism in solids because you might not, uh, you might not uh, know or appreciate uh, where magnetism comes from in solids. So I'll tell you a bit about that. And then, uh, and then I'll, I'll basically go back to that cross section that we were discussing earlier. And I'll talk about that uh, for uh, magnetic systems. And uh, it'll be a little bit complicated just like it was an hour and a half ago or whatever. Uh, and uh, it'll be a little bit complicated again. And so I'll boil it down to some bottom lines that are kind of operational or guiding principles that you can use to think about magnetic scattering and it'll, it'll guide you in the right direction uh, you know, for almost all the time. And then we'll finish off with uh, some examples. And again, I've got more slides than I can sensibly get through. So uh, we'll go as far as we can go. Don't hesitate to ask questions and I'll be around at lunch as well if you've got questions there. So, uh, so magnetism, a very interesting uh, subject, uh, I think. It's been around since antiquity. Um, and uh, probably all of you are familiar with uh, some magnetic materials in your everyday uh, lives, uh, certainly fridge magnets, magnetic materials. So, uh, you know, fridge magnets are uh, ubiquitous, um, uh, you know, all over the place. Your car is loaded with uh, permanent uh, magnets. They're used as uh, actuators and such. And as I say, uh, they've been around since antiquity. So this is, uh, a picture that I got off uh, the internet of, uh, of a spoon. Uh, and the spoon uh, is actually a Chinese spoon from uh, 200 BC. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's made out of uh, lodestone. And lodestone is a mineral, uh, a mineral which contains a lot of iron, okay? And, uh, and basically, this spoon acts like a compass needle. And I don't know how many of you have actually seen a compass needle, but a compass needle, you know, before you had an iPhone is what used to tell you what was north and south and such. <laughs> And, uh, and at any rate, uh, you know, it's basically a magnetized, um, uh, uh, a, a magnetized solid which orients itself with the Earth's magnetic field. And so that's what this spoon did. And this spoon actually, when placed on this surface or when placed on any smooth surface, would the, um, the stalk of the spoon would point in the southward direction, okay? So basically, uh, it's, it's a very old uh, compass needle. And of course, people, knew about this going, going back, uh, you know, well, uh, well BC. And, uh, and of course they used it technologically in order to navigate, okay? So, so very well, very well used, okay? And so, so this was one of the first appreciated uh, forms of what's known as ferromagnetism. And ferromagnetism comes about at least in this instance when uh, the magnetic moments associated with iron so iron is a 3D transition metal. We're gonna talk about this in a moment, but it's a 3D transition metal. So uh, not all of its electronic states are filled. It has a partially filled uh, 3D uh, uh, set of states. And the fact that they're not all filled means that there's a large magnetic moment that's associated with each iron atom. And uh, they, at, at least at room temperature, they all point in the same direction. So they all uh, coherently add together and you get this, they get this macroscopic magnetic moment associated with any piece of say lodestone. And so that magnetic moment generates its own dipole magnetic field. And that dipole magnetic field is sensitive to other magnetic fields like the Earth's magnetic field. And that's what orients compass needles and this spoon uh, in the Earth's magnetic field. And that's why people can navigate with it. So ferromagnetism has been known for a long time. 
okay? And actually, it, it's, as I say, it's part of our everyday experience. Okay, but the interesting and odd thing, at least to me, is that it's actually not a very common form of magnetic material. Ferromagnetic materials like iron are not particularly common. What is much more common is antiferromagnetism. And antiferromagnetism is a very similar phenomenology, except instead of having all the magnetic po moments point in the same direction, the magnetic moments point opposite to each other in such a way that at a microscopic atomic level, they cancel out. Okay. But it's still a magnetically ordered state. And uh, actually now we use antiferromagnets to, uh, to store data and to record lots of data. And this is why you can watch movies on your iPhone today, right? It's because of antiferromagnetism. And antiferromagnetism, in contrast to ferromagnetism, was only experimentally discovered in 1949, and it was discovered here at Oak Ridge. Okay, and uh, I'm going to show you that data in in just a second. Uh, but uh, but so so you know you might ask you know so why you know why the big gap right? Why is magnetism ferromagnetism discovered 500 BC and antiferromagnetism much more common discovered 2,000 years later? Okay, and the reason the thing that we were waiting for in all that time was neutron scattering, okay? And so the famous experiment, and uh, one could argue that this is why Cliff Scholl got the Nobel Prize, was this experiment from uh, about 1950, which actually shows two diffraction patterns. So these are simple powder neutron diffraction patterns of this material here, or uh, this is an idealization of this material. It's actually manganese oxide. So it's a, it's a material that's made up of a, another 3D transition metal. It's not iron, it's manganese. And manganese also has a little magnetic moment associated with it. Okay, and we're gonna talk about that. So this magnetic moment you can think of as one of these little arrows. Okay, and at low temperatures, the arrows don't all line up in the same direction the way they do in lodestone, and they don't form this massive magnetic moment. Okay, they point anti-parallel to each other in such a way that they all, if you were to vectorally add up all these uh, arrows, they would cancel out. Okay. So this is, uh, this is what you get at low temperatures in manganese oxide. And Cliff Scholl and his co-workers, they did a powder neutron diffraction experiment of this at room temperature and measured this pattern that you see at the bottom here. Okay. Uh, so there's some, there's some uh, Bragg peaks here but these Bragg peaks are actually due not to the magnetic periodicity that you see here, but to the chemical periodicity, right? It's a crystalline chemical lattice, so it has Bragg peaks, okay? And then as they cooled the sample down and they could only get down to 80 Kelvin, what they, what they saw is that you had peaks, uh, extra peaks developed. You kept the same peak, so this peak stays around, this peak stays around, okay? But you get these extra peaks here, 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 and here, or I guess here and here. Okay, and so what they discovered for the first time was the formation of an antiferromagnetic state at low temperatures, okay? So, uh, so all magnetic materials, uh, they form an ordered state, okay? And, uh, and into antiquity, we knew about this ordered state. So this ordered state is what you get when you have these interactions between the magnetic moments, and we'll talk about those in a moment, which tend to form uh, this parallel arrangement of the magnetic moments, okay, which is ferromagnetism, okay? And if you go to high enough temperatures, you go out of an energy-dominated regime to an entropy-dominated regime, and the magnetic moments become random, okay? So you get a phase transition from this disordered magnet to this ordered ferromagnet, and that's what gives us compass needles and all that sort of stuff, bridge magnets, all those good things, okay? Okay, but... It doesn't have to be like this. And in fact, nature actually likes this much more than it likes this. Okay? And this example, I don't know how well you can see it, every downspin has upspins as near neighbor and vice versa, okay? in such a way that there is no net magnetic moment for this antiferromagnet over here. Okay? So, so this is actually much more common uh, in nature, okay? but it took the advent of neutron scattering in order to see that it was all around us. So uh, there's a couple of take home messages here, I'll just be a second. So one of them is that the world around us uh, is not necessarily uh, uh, what it seems to be, it's what we are able to observe, okay? And
And as our tools improve uh, to take in the world and the universe uh, around us, our view of the world around us will change in a profound way, and that's what happened here. Yes? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, uh, d were they specifically looking for anti-ferromagnetism or not? And um, actually, my, the, the short answer is I don't know. Okay. And, uh, the, but the longer answer is that they might have been specifically looking for anti-ferromagnetism uh, because anti-ferromagnetism had been postulated on the basis of, uh, of uh, magnetization measurements as a function of temperature by Louis Nael, so a famous uh, French uh, theorist uh, just a little bit before that, uh, actually. So it, it, was, it was around as a, uh, as a conjecture, if you like. Uh, so they, they, could have been, they could have been looking for it. But this was definitely proof positive that they saw it. Actually, Jaime, do you know if they were looking for it or not? You might know more than I do. Yeah, I, I, I think it was, you know, they, they were doing what they could do, right? So they could do this experiment at room temperature. That's pretty easy. And they had liquid nitrogen around, so they could do the liquid nitrogen experiment. I mean, a lot of what we do, we do because we can do it, not necessarily because we're brilliant, right? Although I, th I think in this case, I'm willing, to, I'm willing to say that they were brilliant, right? So, and, and not just for this, for other things too. Right? Anyway, so the story of magnetism is very uh, interesting and important uh, story, especially for neutron scattering, because it really uh, brought neutron scattering to the fore uh, right away. And um, so the, the interaction uh, that that uh, that we're going to be talking about is this interaction where the neutrons, the 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 spin a half magnetic moment of the neutron. So the neutron has a spin a half degree of freedom. It's a spin a half magnetic moment, and uh, and you know that's how it's going to interact with the electrons. But it can only use that to interact with the electrons if the interact if the electrons themselves are somehow producing a magnetic field. And some electrons will do that because the electrons have their own spin angular momentum and, th and they can have a spin magnetic moment. But the electrons can also have, uh, can generate a magnetic field by having charge going around in a circle. If charge goes around in a circle or anything looking like a circle, that will generate magnetic fields too. So that's, that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about the neutrons magnetic moment generating a magnetic field, and that magnetic field interacts with the magnetic field generated by electrons. So, so then, uh, so then where, where does the uh, electron magnetism come from? Because not all, mag not all materials are magnetic. Okay. And basically, m the magnetism is uh, essentially the same as net angular momentum. Actually, there are, there are some uh, minor quibbles about uh, this equivalence. Uh, but for the most part, we can ignore them. I say that if, uh, if an atom uh, has some net angular momentum associated with it, then it will have some magnetism associated with it. So, so in atomic uh, physics, you know, where do you get net angular momentum? You get net angular momentum by having a partially filled atomic shell. Okay? And so where would you get partially filled atomic shells? Just look to the periodic table. Okay? And uh, so typically, you would get it from having uh, a, say, a 3D transition metal or a 4D transition metal or a 5D transition metal, but the 3Ds are more common, so that's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to concentrate on. You have a 3D transition metal, okay, where you've got room for 10 electrons, 10 3D electrons, okay, and, uh, and you haven't filled all those states, okay. If you fill all those states, the net angular momentum will be zero, okay? If none of those states are filled, the net angular momentum will be zero. But if the states are partially filled, then it's likely that there'll be some net angular momentum and that will generate a magnetic moment. So these atoms here, these ions here, are likely candidates for finding magnetic materials, as are these atoms down here, the rare earths, okay? So the rare earths, you know, those are the 4F shell, there's now 14 levels. So again, if you have a partially filled, if you have say 10 uh, 4F electrons instead of 14, the likelihood is that you'll have a magnetic state. Th th there, are, there are exceptions where you don't, but we're not really gonna focus on those. So for transition metals, um, 
uh, it's, it's, it's often the case that their magnetism is particularly simple. And, uh, and that's because uh, a, a sort of uh, architectural motif that's very common in transition metals is this sort of uh, motif here, which I don't know how well you can see it. But it's basically, there's a transition metal ion, okay, which is like copper or manganese or something like that. And it's in the middle of this oxygen six octahedron. Okay? And so the oxygens, if this was an insulating state, the oxygens would be in a two minus oxidation state. So the oxygens are very electronegative. The copper or the manganese would be in something like a, a, a two plus oxidation state. Okay? And uh, so the transition metal ion is feeling a very strong electric field from these electronegative, uh, from these electronegative oxygens. This is referred to as a crystalline electric field. Okay? And the, uh, net, the net effect of this uh, electric field, by the way, this, the structure that I'm showing here is a perovskite structure, very common for transition metal oxides. Okay? And uh, so this is actually the structure of the parent compound for high temperature superconductivity, lanthanum uh, cuprate. Okay, and I'm just using it as an example. But I would say that the net effect of the, of the, um, of the, ox the electronegative oxygens around the transition metal site will give you, um, will reduce the, uh, if you like, the spatial uh, dependence of the d-electron orbitals uh, to, to this form that you see here. Okay, and this, the form that you see here, uh, so you can put two electrons into any one of these states, okay? So if you put two electrons into each of these states, you'd have 10 electrons, okay? So the, the transition metals have room for 10 electrons and you would fill up these states with the electrons and, the, and each of these states, which I'm now gonna call orbitals, you know, the one spin can go up, you know, spin up and another one can go spin down into these orbitals. And the idea behind these orbitals is it's very simple actually, even though I'm probably making it sound more complicated than it is, is that these orbitals show what the electron wave functions would look like. Actually, the electron probability densities would look like. And these ones, which are relatively high energy states, which are called EG orbitals, the electron probability, it points directly at the oxygen two minus ions. So that's a relatively high energy state because the electrons, which are electronegative, point at the oxygens, which are also electronegative. So these are high energy states. These are lower energy states because the electrons point away from these oxygen two minus ions. That's all there is to it. But we've got these 10 states. We, you know, it's really five orbitals, which we can put two different spins into. And, and that's how we're gonna generate our magnetic moments. So if we take something like manganese two plus, you know, manganese two plus has five D electrons, okay? And so we're going to put our five D electrons into these orbitals and see what we're left with, okay? And so uh, there's something called Hund's rules, which basically tells us that the first thing that we should do is try to maximize the total uh, spin uh, of a given atom. And if we've got five D electrons, the way to do that is to put one electron spin up into each of the five orbitals, okay? And so if that's the case, then this manganese two plus ion will have a whopping big magnetic moment because the electrons, the five D electrons associated with this partially filled shell, they're all pointing in the same direction. So they're all gonna add up. This is gonna have a big magnetic moment, okay? So something that'll have a smaller magnetic moment, okay, which might seem surprising, is uh, copper two plus, which has nine D electrons. And you'd say, well, nine D electrons, that's gotta be better than five you know, D electrons. Uh, except it isn't, right? And the reason it isn't is because uh, now you're one electron short of having filled the D levels, right? So if you fill the D levels, then there's no magnetism, okay? So here, uh, you're going to fill up every orbital except the highest energy one. And in that one, you're just gonna have one single spin up electron. But you can see that all the other orbitals are filled up with a pair of spin up and spin down electrons. So they all cancel except this one electron here. Okay. So the magnetism associated with copper two plus, okay, in high temperature superconductors is actually the magnetism associated with a single electron. It's a single spin a half quantum magnetic moment associated with the
the copper two plus. So magnetism in, or if you like, the, the high temperature superconductivity problem, okay, uh, for many people boils down to a problem in quantum magnetism, okay, which is actually in itself quite interesting. But that's, that's just another example of how you would generate a magnetic moment. And then once you've got these magnetic moments in solids, uh, the magnetic moments will interact with each other and it's their interactions with each other, that's what's gonna give you the ordered state. That's what's gonna give you a fridge magnet, that's what's gonna give you a compass needle, that's what's gonna give you an antiferromagnetic structure which you can use to store movies in your iPhone and this sort of thing. Okay. So what's gonna happen, at least in an insulator, what often happens in an insulator is that the magnetic moments interact with each other by a relatively simple Hamiltonian that'll look something like this, some variant of this. So, uh, so what happens uh, is that the interaction between these magnetic moments, say two different manganese magnetic moments, for example. Um, so this interaction is not a real magnetic interaction. It's not a magnetic dipole interaction. You know, it's it's you know if you bring two compass needles together, notice that they start to affect each other. It's not that type of interaction actually. This interaction is in fact uh, is in fact uh, electrostatic. It's an electrostatic interaction, but it's an electrostatic interaction with uh, the uh, Pauli, uh, uh, Pauli principle taken into account. Okay? And so it's referred to as an exchange interaction. So uh, exchange means that uh, you, you imagine exchanging two electrons and seeing how that quantum mechanically changes the state of the system. So, so because these interactions are really electrostatic in origin, they're actually quite strong. And that's why you, you have an ordered magnetic state at room temperature. Ordered magnetic states can, can survive to room temperature because they, their, their origin is actually electrostatic. So the way this works in something called super exchange is that you have a magnetic ion and then it doesn't neighbor another magnetic ion. There's a non-magnetic ion in between like manganese oxide, manganese oxide, manganese oxide, like that, okay? And this non-magnetic ion, even though it's non-magnetic, it actually mediates the interaction between these two. And the net effect is that you get this ordered structure, which could have quite a high energy associated with it, like 300 Kelvin, okay? That's what can happen in insulators. In metals, you can have the same sort of thing going on, except you also have itinerant electrons. You also have electrons that aren't associated with any particular electron or any particular atom. And so you might have these local moments, and this happens in rare earth metals, for example. And around them, you've got a cloud of conduction electrons, which aren't associated with any one atom. Okay? And this local magnetic moment will polarize its cloud of itinerant electrons. Well, that cloud of itinerant electrons is itinerant. It's gonna move. It's not gonna stay with one atom. And so that polarized cloud is gonna move over to the next atom and polarize it. And then it's really the electrons that are gonna be the conduit for informing the local magnetic moments about what's going on. And this is referred to as an RKKY type interaction. This is also electrostatic in origin and it also can happen on a relatively high energy scale. Okay, so independent of what the microscopic origin is for the interactions between the magnetic moments, okay? Uh, you know, we've got these magnetic moments, they're decorating a lattice. They're probably not decorating every atomic position in the lattice because you know, it might be one out of, out of every five or one out of every 10 atoms is magnetic. Most of them are not magnetic, but there's one magnetic atom there. And, uh, and those, those atoms are, those magnetic moments are interacting with each other. And at low temperatures, they're gonna form some sort of an ordered structure, okay? And the ordered structure could be quite complicated and, uh, and uh, it can be quite difficult to understand the nature of the ordered structure, but that's one of our tasks, okay? So you can have ordered structures that look relatively simple, like the single K structure. So these are just structures on a cube, right? I'm not, I'm not you, could, you could have more complicated uh, uh, architectures that you would decorate as well. But these are just structures on a cube. So here's one that's, call, that's called a, a single K structure, relatively simple. It just means that the magnetic moments are all in phase in planes, 
And then there's, a, there's one direction, one single direction, in which the magnetic moments are pi out of phase as you go from layer to layer. Okay? So they go, so it, they're all in phase, out of phase, in phase, out of phase. Very simple structure. Okay? And that has a wave vector associated with it, which is zero, zero, a half. So the zero and zero means that within the AB plane, the first two zeros, it means that everything is in phase in the, in the AB plane. But in the third direction, there's a phase factor of pi, okay, from one edge of the unit cell to the other edge, okay? So what that half means, it really means half of two pi, okay? And half of two pi is pi, okay? And so that's, that's what that half means there, okay? And so you can have more complicated structures, like you can have this half, half, zero, so the half, half, zero means that it's almost the complement of this. It means that there's no phase difference as you go along this direction. That's what the zero means. And the half, half means that you have a pi phase shift as you take any step in the x or y direction. So pi phase shift, pi phase shift, pi phase shift, pi phase shift. That's what the half, half means. Okay. And then you can have you know, variants of this which get more and more complicated. It could be quite hard to understand. But whatever it is, there's some ordered structure that we're going to want to, to uh, understand. And the ordered structure originates because there's some microscopic Hamiltonian, there are some microscopic, uh, there's some microscopic energy functional that uh, is determined by how the crystalline chemistry of how the magnetic moments interact with each other, and the minimum energy state of that is one of these. Okay? And what's going to happen as we go from high temperatures to low temperatures, is that at high temperatures, okay, this is true with everything, at, at high temperatures there will always be an entropy dominated regime, at low temperatures there will always be an energy dominated regime. So in high temperatures we're gonna get a state that's quite disordered. And I should just mention that these are Monte Carlo simulations of a two-dimensional Ising model. So if you know what that is, great. If you don't, it doesn't really matter. So it's, it, this is the simplest model that you could have for magnetism in two dimensions. The two dimensions is just there because it makes it easy to look at. So you, you've, got, you've got black uh, squares and white squares, and the black squares are spins pointing up, and the, and the white squares are spins pointing down. And these spins are interacting with, uh, uh, with each other by uh, a Hamiltonian that is just the product of the Z component of spin, so whether they point up or down, right? So if they point up, it's plus one. If they point down, it's minus one. So the ground state for this system is that this system would be perfectly happy having all the spins point up, so all uh, black, I guess, or all the spins point down, all white, okay? It doesn't care which of those two things happen. So at high temperatures, it's, it's disordered, but it's not completely disordered, okay? that you can see there's little, uh, there's little islands of upspins and downspins, but there's as much up as there is down, right? If you averaged over this, it would be. And then you get close to the phase transition, and there's this region where uh, it, there's still as much up as there is down, but now it's developing some very significant structure, okay? And you can see that you've got islands of up and down, but they're, it's almost, uh, you know, they're almost, uh, it's some sort of interconnected geometry. And you, you can actually go from one side of the crystal to the other, you know, either you know, taking a path that is only in the black spins or only in the white spins. Okay? So this point at the, at the phase transition is very special. And then when you go through the phase transition, you break symmetry. Okay? That's the characteristic of the phase transition. Okay? The Hamiltonian, the energy of the system, would have been perfectly happy having uh, the ground state be all black or all white, okay? It doesn't care, but it picked one, okay? And, uh, and uh, so that's the broken symmetry. So this is what's gonna happen as you go through any phase transition, and we'll come back to this later on. But let's, let's uh, go back to determining the nature of this state. So this is a very simple state. It's all spins, say, pointing up, or all spins pointing down, or most of them pointing up, most of them pointing down. But these states can be, can be uh, more complicated and we're gonna want to understand them. And we're gonna wanna understand them you know, the same way that we talked about uh, understanding inelastic neutron scattering. This is you know, another just general form of that, now specific to, to magnetic neutron scattering. So, um, so the neutron has a magnetic moment, okay? It's a spin a half magnetic moment, 
So mathematically, we would write this down as uh, a poly spin operator because that's the way we represent spin a half degrees of freedom. If you know what that is, great. If you don't, don't worry about it. Uh, the strength of the magnetic moment, it's a nuclear ba uh, ma magneton. So this is actually a, a considerably smaller magnetic moment than the electron itself carries. The electron itself also carries a spin a half magnetic moment, but the magnitude of that spin a half magnetic moment is a Bohr magneton. And the difference between those is that instead of having the mass of the neutron in the denominator, you've got the mass of the electron in the denominator. And the electron's much lighter than the neutron, so it's a bigger magnetic moment. So this is a pretty small magnetic moment, but it doesn't matter. It's still a magnetic moment. Okay. And so what's going to happen uh, when we, when we, uh, when we you know, bring a neutron in proximity to uh, a magnetic solid, you know, uh, as before, we're going to want to calculate a cross-section. It's exactly as we had before. So we're going to want to calculate the transition rate or the, the rate at which the neutron scatters from its initial wave vector K and polarization if we, if we monitor the polarization. I think later on you're going to have a talk uh, devoted to polarization analysis. So I'm not going to talk about it now. Uh, so the neutron's going to change from its initial momentum to its final momentum. And the sample that it's scattering off is going to change from its initial state to its final state. Okay, and so these, this is uh, essentially exactly what we had before. We've got these terms out front. Remember, there was a k prime over k that we talked about, and then there's these constants. It's the mass of the neutron and two pi h bar squared. Uh, th these are kinematic terms. They, they, they. There's no. It, it's nothing connected with the physics or chemistry of your sample. This is the part that has the physics and chemistry of your sample. It's describing how the magnetic moment of the neutron is interacting with whatever magnetism is present in your sample. Okay, and it's this matrix element squared. That's what we're going to have to study. Okay, and then we've got this energy conserving delta function, okay, which I, I don't think I had in before, but I'm putting it in now. Uh, and basically, all it's saying is that if the neutron or if the sample changes energy, from its uh, initial state to its final state, the only thing the sample is interacting with is the neutron. So if the, if the sample changes energy, that energy has to be taken away by the neutron. There's nowhere else for it to go. Okay. So, so that last term is just energy con uh, conservation. And the nature of the interaction between the magnetic moment of the neutron and whatever magnetism is in the solid is you know, basically, we've got the neutron's uh, uh, dipole magnetic moment, okay? So it's relatively small, but there's some dipole magnetic field emanating from the neutron. And it's going to feel the magnetic, it's going to sense the magnetic field due to the spins of the electrons if there are any unpaired spins. Because remember, if we fill up, uh, if we fill up the orbit completely, you know, we'll have no unpil unf unfilled uh, states, we'll have no angular momentum, you know, there, there won't be any, any moment associated with it. So uh, if there are un, uh, unpaired electron spins, then they will produce a dipole magnetic field, okay? And that dipole magnetic field can interact with the dipole magnetic field of the neutron, okay? And the way that is written down, it's just uh, written down as a dot product, there actually should be a dot here, it's minus the moment of the neutron, which is this here, uh, with a dot product with the magnetic field due to the electron spin and the magnetic field due to the orbital motion of the electrons. So the electrons are charged particles, so if they, if they move around in anything that looks like a circular orbit, that will generate magnetic fields as well. So, so magnetic fields can be generated within solids, and they're generated either by the unpaired spins of the electrons or orbital motion. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how they're generated, uh, they would interact with the neutron the same sort of way. Okay. So, uh, so evaluating that matrix element is not completely trivial, and I'm going to kind of jump to the uh, bottom line and then give you some uh, some guiding principles. Um, there's actually there's actually three or four different pieces here. There's a piece out front that is the kinematic piece. There's a piece here, which originates from the fact that it's the dipole moment of the neutron interacting 
with the dipole magnetic moments associated with uh, the spin of the electron, for example. Uh, and uh, so this is going to give us some polarization information even in an unpolarized uh, neutron scattering experiment, okay? And we'll come back to that. Um, and then our experiment is going to depend on the magnetic form factor of, uh, of the atom that's doing the scattering, okay? So this is the equivalent. The equivalent of this for uh, phonon scattering was that Q dot eigenvector squared, okay? And the Q dot eigenvector squared was the term that let us you know, distinguish between a longitudinal phonon and a transverse phonon, okay? So this is going to let us uh, distinguish between magnetic neutron scattering and phonon scattering because magnetic neutron scattering has uh, this form factor dependence to it. And what the form factor is telling us is that the magnetic electrons, these D electrons, the D electrons are not localized at the nucleus of, uh, of the atom, okay? They're actually extended out, you know, something like, uh, you know, maybe one uh, angstrom away from the nucleus of the atom, maybe a little bit more. So they, ha they have some distribution, they have some spatial distribution. And because of that, uh, when we think of the condition for constructive interference from different magnetic moments in the solid, we've got to remember that the magnetic moment is not localized at the, at the nucleus, it's extended. And the fact that it's extended means that the scattering the, the, or the condition for constructive interference will fall off as you go out to larger momentum transfers. So one of the characteristics of any magnetic neutron scattering experiment is that the signal tends to be concentrated at low momentum transfer and the signal falls off at high momentum transfer, okay? And that's exactly the complement of phonon scattering. Phonon scattering went like momentum transfer dot eigenvector squared. So forget about the eigenvector, it's momentum transfer squared. Phonon scattering increases as you go to larger momentum transfer. Magnetic scattering decreases. So that's one way you can distinguish uh, the two, okay? So then you've got these, uh, these matrix elements here, which basically, uh, you know, the, the kind of business end of them, the only end that we're really gonna talk about are that you've got these spin operators. So these are SX, SY, and SZ uh, operators here, and you've got two of them. That's really the only important thing, okay? And then you've got this energy conserving delta function. And actually what I'm gonna show you next is, uh, is a mathematical trick that uh, incorporates this delta function uh, together with these, and it's going to give us, you know, basically another pair correlation function. Okay. So this is the outcome of that trick. Okay, we've got this spin pair correlation function. So this is telling us that uh, we've got all these other factors, but at the end of the day, really the physics or the chemistry of our sample is going to be embodied in this spin paracorrelation function. So it's a lot like the paracorrelation functions that we talked about before. It's saying if we know something about the alpha component of spin at site zero and time zero, what do we know about the beta component of spin at site L and time T? And actually it's a Fourier transform of that, okay? This is where, this is where, you know, whatever the uh, magnetic structure is and whatever the, uh, the spin, uh, dynamics are, all of that is embodied into this quantity here, okay? So, uh, so basically, the Fourier transform of this is S of Q and omega, and so I've now changed Q to kappa. Uh, I, I don't know why I did that necessarily. But we still got, we still got these pieces. We've got the form factor squared. We've got this, uh, this term here that's gonna give us some polarization uh, information, okay? So uh, actually, it's gonna tell us that uh, we are, insensitive to magnetic moments which lie in the same direction as the momentum transfer. Okay, this is a consequence of the dipole of the neutron interacting with the dipole of the uh, electron uh, moment. Okay, okay, if you, uh, if you, I don't know if you know this, but if you've, got, if you've got a dipole magnetic moment, it has a dipole magnetic field associated with it. Okay, it kind of, kind of looks like a butterfly right, the, there's, there's, there are no magnetic field lines coming out along the moment. Okay, is this familiar to anybody? <laughs> okay. 
So you've got the magnetic field lines from the dipole come out uh, in all directions except the direction of the dipole itself. And so if you've got two of these dipoles interacting with each other, their, or their relative orientation is important. Okay. And so, you know, I'm just going to skip to the answer, and that, that gives you this term, which tells you that, that you are insensitive to moment components that point along the direction of the momentum transfer. And so it means that you will only see those components of magnetic moments which lie in a plane perpendicular to the momentum transfer. So these are the bottom lines for magnetic neutron scattering, and if this is the only thing that you remember, it's not a bad outcome. Okay. So uh, the first thing is that this is not weak scattering. Okay. Uh, that it's usually the case that the magnetic scattering is somewhat weaker than the strongest nuclear scattering, but it's not necessarily the case. There are certainly examples where that's not that's not true. So this is comparable in in strength to the nuclear scattering. Uh, it goes like a magnetic form factor squared, and that's because the magnetic electrons are not located at the nucleus. They're extended about it. They might be one angstrom or one and a half angstroms away from the nucleus in sort of a cloud, and that's going to kill off any constructive interference effect at large momentum transfer. So large momentum transfer, you won't see magnetism because of the form factor. You've got this polarization term that I just talked about. You're only sensitive to those components of magnetic moment which lie in a plane perpendicular to the magnetic field, uh, sorry, to the, um, to the uh, momentum transfer. And we're going to have matrix elements that look like spin operators uh, taken between the states of your sample. Okay? And that's where the physics is going to come in. But these spin operators, the only spin operators you can have are uh, Sx, Sy, and Sz, and that's because they're dipole allowed spin operators. Okay? So these can also be S plus, S minus, and Sz. So for a diffraction experiment, basically what you're going to do is you're going to add up these spin correlations with a phase that's set by the momentum transfer. It's set by k minus k prime. And you're going to look at a term that looks like this. So you're, you're, you're adding up on each of the sites, you're adding up these types of uh, spin uh, uh, degrees of freedom with a phase that is set by the momentum transfer. Okay. So, uh, the, so this is just showing uh, how the uh, form factor typically falls off. So it's highest at small momentum transfer and it falls off at large momentum transfer. Okay. So because the, the d electron cloud or the magnetic electron cloud, it typically extends out about one angstrom, okay, the, the range in momentum transfer that magnetic scattering falls out at is about pi divided by one angstrom. Because this is really a, 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 a constructive interference effect. Okay? And, and so uh, by the time you get out to you know, pi divided by the spatial extent of the magnetic electron cloud uh, scattering from different positions within the magnetic cloud is no longer interfering constructively, it's interfering destructively. So that's why it's set by pi divided by one inverse angstrom. So typically, if you're at three to four angstroms, the magnetic scattering is starting to get weak, typically. Okay. And it can have a, a different shape depending on you know, some of the differences. So uh, as was the case when we were talking about inelastic scattering, you know, there's three different types of uh, scattering experiments we can do, which are kind of, in some ways, all the same. Elastic scattering, energy integrated scattering, inelastic scattering. And so for elastic scattering, you know, uh, you know this is what the cross-section would look like, form factor, polarization factor, and then we're going to add up the spins at different sites with uh, a particular phase factor that's set by the momentum transfer. So I'll go through uh, a particularly easy example. So this is the example of uh, uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2. Uh, and, uh, and for our purposes, all you have to know about this is that the magnetic moment in this solid is associated with the uranium atom. And the uranium, in this case, has a partially filled 5F shell, not a 4F shell, but a 5F shell. And it forms this body tetragonal structure. So most of the ions here are non-magnetic. 
but the uraniums, which are at the corners of this body tet tetragonal structure and at the body center, that's where the magnetism is. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the answer and then show you, you know, where you would find the magnetic scattering. So this is the answer, and it's very simple. So the magnetic moments, they point along the C direction only. And uh, they're all in phase within a given plane. But then the spin that's at the middle of the body center is out of phase. Okay. So you might think, well, we should have our momentum transfer along the C direction here. So that would be our momentum transfer would be zero, zero, 001. So the zero, 00 means that that we add the spins together in phase in the AB plane. These are all in phase, these are all in phase. And we have a um, a one, and the one really means two pi phase difference when we go from one edge of the unit cell to the upper edge of the unit cell. Okay. So if this is two pi, if that phase difference is two pi, then this phase difference, which is halfway along, is pi. And so we would add these together in phase with these and out of phase with that. And that gives us a big moment, so that looks very good, except that uh, the moment direction is actually parallel to our Q. Okay. So our polarization uh, part of the cross section tells us that, that this will give us no scattering, okay, because we're only sensitive to those components and moments which lie in a plane perpendicular to Q. So that's not going to work. So then let's look, let's try uh, a wave vector like 1, 0, 0. So then let's look at this structure from the top down, and we see we've got up spins at all the corners and down spins in the middle. And we're, we're going to add things together uh, in phase in both the, uh, in both the uh, if you like, the y and the z direction, and out of phase in the x direction. Well, not out of phase, but with a phase factor of 2 pi. So again, we're going to add these together with a phase factor of 2 pi across here. So that's pi across here. So that's good. That will flip the spin here, give us a, a, a net uh, a positive uh, net moment, if you like. And now our wave vector 1, 0, 0 is perpendicular to the moment direction. So this is going to give us a lot of uh, strong diffraction. Okay. So that just gives you an example of uh, how you might think about at least this very simple structure. And then in terms of the inelastic scattering, uh, if I use, say, manganese as an example. So manganese is a case, it's an easy case to think about because there's a half-filled uh, 3D shell if it's manganese 2 plus. We've got five spin a half electrons. They're all pointing in the same direction. So we would have S equals five halves. And uh, so that means that uh, they're going to be in magnetic field, they're going to be six degenerate states. Okay, so each of these states, they're all going to have the same uh, eigenvalue s times s plus one, but they're going to have different z components of spin. Okay, and those different z components of spin are going to go from the maximally polarized spin, which is plus five halves h bar, down to three halves, one half, minus a half, minus three halves, minus five halves. That's why there's six of them. Okay, so you've got these six states. And they're all degenerate if there's no magnetic field. But if you apply a magnetic field, they'll split up like this. They'll split up equally into these six non-degenerate states. And the ground state would be this one that's, if you like, fully polarized. And we know that in an inelastic neutron scattering experiment, you know, we can, we can have the neutron come in, interact with this system in its ground state, and cause a transition from its ground state to this first excited state at three halves. And we can do that because there's a dipole allowed uh, matrix element that will do that. So if we have an S minus operator, it will lower the Z component of spin eigenvalue from five halves to three halves. It'll make this transition, okay? And that'll give you a non-zero value for this matrix element. So this will give you inelastic scattering. Okay, I'll try to wrap up quickly. And so if we, if we put these manganese two plus ions together into a lattice and into a one dimensional lattice to make things easy and, uh, and we bring them into an ordered state. So in an ordered state, uh, there's a net uh, exchange field. If you like, it's as if there's a, or a mean exchange field. 
So it's as if there is a magnetic field present even though there is no externally applied magnetic field. And that mean exchange field is, is, is the exchange field that's generated by the interactions between the manganese ions. So if they're all in their ground state, then the, uh, then the state of every manganese spin would be in its most polarized uh, form. So with mz equals five halves at every site across here, okay, that would be the ground state. And then the excited state, what we're gonna do is we're gonna come in with a neutron with wave vector uh, or with, uh, yeah, with wave vector k, and we're gonna scatter inelastically off this with wave vector k prime, and it's gonna cause a transition from the fully polarized mz equals five halves to the mz equals three half state. So it's gonna put a defect into the lattice. Okay. Now the thing is that if the Hamiltonian looks anything like this, where the moments are coupled together or the spins are coupled together by this exchange term, then this state is not an eigenstate of this Hamiltonian. Okay. So quantum mechanically, uh, a state with a single defect at one of these sites you know, can't exist. And so what can exist is that this defect state gets spread out over all of the other states. And instead of having one site take the full hit, actually the full hit gets distributed over all the sites. And so they, you know, if we think semi-classically, we decrease the polarization of the magnetic moment at each site by a little bit and tip the spins off in the transverse direction. And uh, they then, uh, those transverse spins then uh, have this coherent oscillation, which we refer to as a spin wave. So that's the nature of the elementary excitation that we get in these ordered moments. And so these, uh, these spin waves, you know, they're a lot like phonons now. They can have different, uh, different wavelengths, different wave vectors. And uh, you know, if you make their wave length shorter, it, there'll be higher energy states because their underlying Hamiltonian minimizes their energy by having the spins point parallel to each other or anti-parallel for an anti-parallel magnet. Okay, so if you make this wavelength uh, shorter, uh, you, you cause the spins to rotate more from site to site and that gives you a higher energy spin wave. Okay, so, uh, so that's the way in which you would, uh, in which you would calculate um, or measure uh, uh, the, the elementary spin excitations, the magnetic structures, the elementary spin excitations. If you understand the same way, if you understand the momentum versus energy relationship of the phonons, okay, you can basically work backwards and understand uh, the microscopic Hamiltonian that describes the, uh, if you like, the interatomic potentials between the atoms and the nature of the forces that hold the atoms together in the solids. You can do the same thing for uh, the spin wave analysis. If you understand the elementary excitations in a magnetically ordered system, you can work backwards and understand the magnetic Hamiltonian, and from there you understand everything. Okay. So actually, uh, you know, the, the goal of understanding the microscopics of how the spins interact with each other, that actually underlies everything. It underlies, you know, so if you give that to your theory colleagues, they can calculate every magnetic property, every thermodynamic property, everything, right? So, there, so that's why uh, neutron scattering is so important in magnetism. It's important generally, but it's particularly important in these problems where you know, you can provide uh, your, the colleagues working in your field with the Hamiltonian with which they can then do whatever, right? And it really empowers a lot of other research. So I'm not gonna say very much more ab about this because I'm out of time, um, but I think I got to most of the things that I wanted to say. I just say that the, 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 the signal that we observe in inelastic neutron scattering it's not unrelated from the signal that you observe if you do, say, a magnetic susceptibility measurement. In fact, they're quite similar to each other. Uh, and so the inelastic neutron scattering uh, uh, signal is related to a dynamic susceptibility. Okay, it's a, related to a momentum-dependent dynamic susceptibility. And the limit of that uh, dynamic susceptibility uh, for zero momentum transfer uh, can be related to what you measure for in a DC squid susceptibility measurement. So, so these things aren't, are, you know, what you measure in your lab when you're getting ready for your experiment to come here and what you measure here, they're not two different 
independent things, they're related to each other. And the strength of the scattering that you measure here, right? So uh, if you measure scattering at a particular wave vector in a particular energy, you know, the, in the intensity of the signal that you get, uh, it's hard to say very much about it that's general. However, if you can measure over all energies and over an entire Brillouin zone, so an entire unit cell of this reciprocal lattice that I t keep talking about, if you measure over a single Brillouin zone and over all energies, then what you measure has to be proportional to the size of the moment uh, in the sample that you're studying. So if your magnetic moment you know, for, for manganese corresponded to spin five halves, then you know, if you had uh, a particular manganese-based compound, you know, the integral over all that inelastic scattering would be you know, basically, you know, it, it goes essentially like S squared. It goes like, uh, you know, it'd be five halves times seven halves. Okay? Compare that to the, if everything was exactly the same, except for you change the manganese two plus to copper two plus, okay, then the integral of all that scattering goes from, you know, five halves squared, basically, to a half squared. So it goes way, way down because it goes like S squared. It's not really S squared. It's really S times S plus one. Okay. But the intensity that you measure uh, over an entire Brillouin zone and all uh, energies, you know, is given by a sum rule, and the sum rule just depends on the moment size. And with that, I think I'll, I'm sure I'll finish. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So thanks. <laughs>